Chucky. And I'm your friend to the end. Heidi fucking ho. Ha, ha, ha. And welcome back to Chucky Queers. It's our weekly coverage of Don Mancini's sci-fi show. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace, and we are discussing episode two, Let the Right One In. So yeah, we're clearly doing a um a, a list of movie titles for episodes this season. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Uh, this is an interesting one, because obviously it could refer to Chucky having infiltrated the White House, or the fact that our trio have managed to snuggle up to Grant. Oh my god, but girl, like, okay, did I not call that Miss Fairchild was, like, gonna be on the out soon? I just didn't think it was gonna be this soon. This soon? (laughs) Yeah, I I definitely have it in my notes. Oh, points to Trace for calling this, but uh, (laughs) it's disappointing, right? I mean, I think the reason it's disappointing is because we like the character, we like the actress, we didn't want this for her. I'm not going to lie. I'm not sure we needed to kill her in this particular episode, but we'll see if it raises the stakes. It's going to be interesting. I mean, to be fair, they're getting into the White House a lot faster than I would have anticipated. Um, Yes. Like, this seemed very easy, and I was like, you know what? That's fine. I don't need us, like, wasting time before we finally get here. Interestingly enough, I don't know if you noticed this. So, again, I'm peek behind the curtains, everyone. And our screeners, uh, you know, they had this marked as episode two, but, like, Mm -hmm. the production number was 303. Yes. Whereas next week's episode, episode three, was 302. So I wonder, because that's the Jennifer Tilly episode, mm-hmm. if it's just Jennifer Tilly material, so they could have aired in any order. And I wonder why they opted to do this one first. Yeah, I can't help but wonder if they're trying to up the ante and make it feel like, okay, we've got some narrative progression, we've gotten mm-hmm. to Washington, we've got our entry into the White House, and obviously it's a killer ending to this episode where Chucky once again calls our trio and says, <laughs> hey, it's going to be the bloodiest Halloween yet. Yeah. So that's a great way to end it, but I won't lie, I I think after these episodes air, I might go back and watch them in this original order and watch this one third to see Mm. how it plays and how that affects the pacing. See, that's interesting. I actually think that this, this, I I didn't mind this episode. That was fine, but I kind of wish it was like two part two of a two part premiere. Like if they aired the first two episodes back to back, I think this might play better. Yeah, because I I definitely messaged you and said, I don't know how much we're going to have to talk about this feels a little bit slight. And it's not that it's not enjoyable to watch because Chucky is always fun. Mm -hmm. But this definitely felt like a transition episode, you know, we're setting things up. And even though we're killing a couple of people, and I gotta say, the bloodshed. Is oh, so much better this season. I don't know what the fuck they're oh, doing. Yeah. That that throat slit, which at first I, I, I literally I was like, okay, it's a throat slit. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're really pumping the blood out. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Her head's going backwards. <laughs> Honestly, it was the exact right escalation. Yeah. I I knew that they knew that that was going to be our reaction, right? Where it's like, yeah. oh, okay, you know, oh, it's a throat slit. Oh, it's two throat slashes. And then her head totally comes off. Comes off. And it's fantastic. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. Did I say last week that this was Sarah Sherman or did I say this offline to you? Because just as I said, this is not Sarah Sherman, but Sarah Sherman okay. is going to be in this season because she's in the trailer for the show. <laughs> okay, I don't remember that, but sure. No, this character's name is Sam. Sam. But um, yeah, I mean, she's not a character. I actually thought we were going to suggest she was having an affair with the president, which we do find out he has had an affair, but I could but not identify gravy. the woman. <laughs> well, it. It apparently seems fine, but oh. I couldn't figure out if this was her in those pictures uh, or if it's just someone else. You know who I think it is? I think it's the uh, the reporter from last week. Gretchen? Uh, that's who I think. I think that's why she's so mischievous. Oh, interesting. And why she's like, oh, the president of transparency, huh? Because that didn't come out publicly as we find out. But at least the right. wife knew. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I made a note in my notes that the president and the first lady have a very good relationship. Like they seem mm-hmm. to get along. I actually really like the sexual chemistry between Largine Charstecki and Devon mm-hmm. Sawa. But um, yeah, I mean, clearly they have had some marital issues in the past. Which, you know what? Uh, that that can bring people closer together. Um, sure. He doesn't have a ton to do in this episode, but she no. does. Because she's brought in on like an espionage mission with Mr. Price. Like a mm-hmm. 
super secret service agent. <laughs> yeah, I got the impression that he's some kind of fixer, right? Because he says, mm-hmm. I've come in to clean up. Because, of course, he's talking about the body from last week, Teddy. Right. So he's on damage control. But then, of course, we've got two more bodies to clean up by the end of this episode. So we've got Sam and then as we mentioned, science teacher. <laughs> yes, science teacher. Um, yeah, I get because this one split more 50-50 between the plot lines, though. Um, and, and again, <laughs> we at least bring them together much quicker than I would have anticipated. Um, but we're definitely spending a lot more time with our central trio in this episode. But I guess yeah. um, maybe before we get to them, do you want to talk about this Mr. Price and uh, the First Lady stuff? Yeah, I don't really have strong feelings about it. It's always nice to see gil bellows he's a canadian actor obviously most people are going to recognize him from ally mcbeal most people of a certain age are going to recognize him from ally mcbeal but i am definitely (laughs) one of those people (laughs) me too me too (laughs) yeah uh as you said he's like a dark and mysterious figure he also seems to have a relationship with her like there's a very clear reason why he didn't go to president collins and i can't tell if that's just because he would have insisted on being transparent whereas he knows the first lady is maybe not as much on the up and up with being transparent. Yeah. And I, I, I hope he's kind of smarter than like any other like cop in this type of show would be because I mean, he yes. finds Chucky's footprint in that closet and he, mm-hmm. he doesn't seem to like brush it away. He's kind of like, huh? Okay. There's yeah. A footprint. <laughs> he, he's a weird character. I'm struggling to get a, a read on him because he's also cracking one liners about, Oh, sorry about your antique. Sorry about this, this rug that we're going to have to confiscate. Yeah. I will say I love how much the show both tries to maintain a certain amount of like logistics, like, like believability, Mm -hmm. but then also has a group of cleaners show up to the White House in the middle of the night and take a giant body size chess out and drive it away (laughs) just because they can. Yeah. I, I, I'm at least happy Troy Stecky's getting more to do this season than she is last season. Like she's pro- mm-hmm. like a proper main character this season. Actual she... main character. Yes. And she's killing it. I'm loving her oh, yeah. performance. Absolutely. But yeah, this is very much, it's, it's more continuing setup because again, like we don't see this reporter from last week. Um, mm-hmm. Henry's barely in the episode this week. Yeah. Vice President Spencer, if if I've pegged that guy correctly, he shows up only for the one scene where it's basically just a, oop, don't let him into the yeah, Oval don't Office. The door. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also like, why would the Vice President be going into the Oval Office in the middle of the night? Maybe we'll find that answer out in, a, well, in two weeks, maybe not next week. <laughs> right. Yes. I mean, none of these are deal breakers. If nothing else, it's just kind of, okay, we're still spending a lot of time at the White House setting some of this stuff up. And I think part of it is that it's going to be very exciting when we get back to this Halloween party, presumably in a couple of weeks. Well, and that and that's the thing, because I really do think we're going to be doing just the Jennifer Tilly and Nika show and Caroline yeah. show next week, which means that the next episode, which is the mid-season finale, is going to be this big Halloween party at the White House. Yeah, which I'm not going to lie. We said they need some kind of big episode to hold us over until 2024 yeah. and a Halloween party at the White at House the White with House. Chucky. <laughs> Sounds like a really fucking good time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so what about our trio, right? Um, Devin and Drake still don't get to fuck, although I did really, really like the walk-in scene. <laughs> yes, uh, Jake, your shirt is on Inside Out. And also now we get to have the talk. <laughs> And they already know who's going to top and who's going to bottom. Well, I'm sorry. Well, Devin, Devin knows Devin. who's going to top. <laughs> okay. So what do you, what does that tell you? To me, that was, oh, so Devin's going to bottom. Yeah, right? 100%. Because I feel yeah. like, I mean, not to like get too consenty about it, but I feel like if one, I mean, both people should consent when having sex, obviously. But obviously. when you're consenting to a position, I feel like the bottom is more likely the one that has to be like, yes, I'm okay doing that. Yes, I'm volunteering for this because it's more work for me. Well, I mean, he was like, we'll talk later. And I was like, I think he's been practicing on his own. (laughs) Oh, my. But also when? Because these kids apparently don't even get 10 minutes alone. No! And it's all three of them in one hotel room. I was like, really? But you know what? I really appreciate Miss Fairchild. It's like, you know what? Mm Y'all are teenagers. You're going to have sex. Let me just go through it. And granted, she, she doesn't like really get through anything Mm -mm. (laughs) but she just hands in the packet so it's fine yeah it was interesting to see how the show handles this kind of stuff because they've obviously been very candid about Mm -hmm. 
you know, trailblazing, breaking some new ground in the depiction of queer youth. And previously, this has been a love story, but the season three arc for these two characters is very much a, okay, they're of a certain age, and they've been at this for a few years, and now they're DT. I mean, also, like, when I was a teenager, I could have used a TV show like this to be like, hey, like, here's people talking about having, two men, two boys talking about having sex. Like, I didn't have that when I was growing up. Yeah. I mean, not to put a date on this recording, because we are doing it a bit in advance, but, like, here in Canada today, we had nationwide LGBTQ protests against uh, teaching gender identity in the curriculum. Thankfully, they were actually outshouted, outmatched in volume. Like, it was 40 to 1 for people who were pro-gender identity in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, like, we were having none of this bigotry. But it just proved to me that shows like Chucky are still vitally important, especially for younger audiences who are like, oh, I need to see a positive depiction of young boys who want to fuck because it's okay. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. um, Are they are they already teaching gender identity in schools? Oh, yeah. yeah, We we don't have that in Texas. (laughs) (laughs) Except you don't live in Texas anymore. You got to figure out whether or not you can slam Denver in Colorado. Yeah, I don't know if Colorado does it or not. I mean, I just think the U.S. in general isn't like big on teaching gender identity, but maybe in California. Um, I guess really the last bit um, is uh, Lexi and Grant. So do we think they're setting them up as like a romantic couple as well? I'm interested in this because Lexi seems slightly open to it but at the same time she kind of acts like she's okay I'll take the bullet I will distract Grant so that we can do the things that we need Mm -hmm. to do but I really appreciated I mean we've had such a journey with this character and how much we fucking hated her wanted her to die in season one came around on her loved her in season two and these emotional beats where she makes herself vulnerable and says, you know, yeah, I've lost somebody. And then Grant says the same kind of thing to his mom. I was just like, the show is so good at finding those key moments to mm-hmm. offer some genuine pathos, empathy, that yeah. kind of stuff. In a show that is known for being a bloody, like, campy romp, like the fact that it does nail those emotional beats really is a testament to its to everything. Yeah, it's like uh, within 10 minutes, we're going to watch a woman get fucking decapitated and blood just go everywhere in the Oval Office. But the show also manages to tug at your heartstrings. I just I'm really impressed with how they're able to negotiate that tone. And piggybacking off what I said last week, again, I'm really surprised and impressed with how they're kind of subverting my expectations with the Grant character. Like, he definitely does play kind of like an asshole when they meet in the coffee yes. shop. But yes, that, he that, does. It does feel like a front. Like, I genuinely like this character, and I look forward uh-huh. to knowing more about him as the weeks go on. Yeah, I mean, even when he's basically laying into his mom, because they, they've had a couple of spats in just mm-hmm. the two episodes. I don't think they dislike each other, but that's where the friction lies. Yeah. And I like that he said, you know, this is what real kids get to do. They get to have friends because she doesn't approve of these kids because they're bad PR. Well, okay, I'm also kind of like, that. okay, now that Miss Fairchild's dead, because A, and she died in the White House, and mm-hmm. that woman helped cover it up. So... These three or now orphans again, orphans again are just like on their own in the hotel room. I was like, okay, so is the White House going to adopt them now? Like, it's... <laughs> I definitely thought that. I was like, oh, so we're just going to be living at the White House for the rest of the season. I don't think so. I think this is going to be a very condensed timeline. Okay, see, I think that Grant's going to be like, hey, mom, like they need a place to stay. Just put them somewhere in the White House. But although may- maybe it's a thing too, where um, I mean, I don't know if they already like written all of season uh, mm-hmm. three or not before the strike right. happened, but maybe it could yeah. be like, oh, one, three A is the White House. And then we're going somewhere else for three B. Yeah. I mean, you never really know what Chucky's going to do. Mm-hmm. And of course I keep bringing up Hannibal, but it's yeah. partially because like Nick and Tosca is working on this. There's other factors at play, which like link the two shows together, but you know, Hannibal famously started to do half seasons in its third season as well, right? So sometimes it's a smart decision to just say, okay, that part of the story is over and we either time jump or we move locations so that we can tell new, fresh, interesting stories. Yeah, I do want to point out the two before we kind of like wrap this up. So there are are four screenwriters on this episode, not just uh, the usual two, but we've got Catherine Scatina, Amanda Blanchard, Alex DeLille, and Rachel Paradis. But the director of this episode is John Mm -hmm. Hyams, aka the guy that directed last year's Sick and right. 2020's Alone that we both really liked. 
Yes. Ironically enough, uh, Sheree Bohannon and I are also covering Black Summer, which he was the main executive director and oh. director. Sorry, executive producer and director. And that show was fucking terrible. But it was because oh. <laughs> they literally do not care about characters. Like the action was amazing, but they had no characters and no narrative. It was the weirdest thing. That's yeah, that is very weird. Jamie King zombie show. Oh, you told me about this. Oh, mm-hmm. OK. I thought you told me to watch it. So maybe I'm glad I didn't listen to you. Or so it, st- it started well and then it goes <laughs> off the rails, but not in a good way. Uh, anyway, if people want to yeah. hear me talk about that, seek out those other episodes. But yeah, I mean, he's a great director. Yeah. He's got a fantastic visual eye and set pieces are his forte. So this makes sense. Yeah, makes absolute sense. I'm looking forward to again to see who we have in the next two episodes. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. Uh, we've already kind of predicted what we think is going to happen. So I guess we can uh, cross out, let the right one in. Indeed. And cross out Chucky Queers. Mm-hmm.